Hello and welcome to another lecture, Mr. Gutchick's lecture, Supply and Demand. Today we're going to be covering the determinants of demand. Uh, but first I wanted to review a very important concept that's going to make the determinants a little bit more understandable. And so again, uh, you should be able, sitting there at your desk, to uh, complete what I'm going to say next. There's only one variable that changes quantity supplied. And remember, that is price. That's the only variable that's going to change quantity supplied. The same is true with demand. Remember that. And the same is true with demand, with that, the fact that price does not change either supply or demand. And so I wanted to review because when we get into this, it's going to be a, make, this is going to make a lot more sense. And so guess how many determinants of demand there are? Four, five, three. You'd be wrong with all of them. There are actually eight. And these eight are extremely important. Now, some textbooks, um, they'll, they'll reduce it down to six. Others I've seen as little as five. Um, but I make it so that there are eight. You're going to kind of see that a couple of them kind of branch off of one another. Um, and so that's why I, I like to say that there are eight determinants of demand. Um, if you don't memorize these, you're going to fail the test. There shouldn't be any questions. Um, but these are extremely important, and, and a vast majority of your tests at the end of this unit um, is going to be based around these eight determinants of demand and the determinants of supply as well. We'll get to those in the next lecture, though. All right, so what does an increase in demand look like? Remember that price doesn't change demand. It only changes the quantity demand. So in other words, with this, we're dealing with the movement of the actual demand line. There's the original demand line, so let me get my pen here. There's the original demand line we're talking about right down here. An increase in demand is an actual right shift in the line. And so... Whenever I ask you, when I ask you in class, when demand increases, what does that look like? It's just a simple shift to the right of demand. Uh, inversely, then, a decrease in demand is a leftward shift. So this would be your um, original demand line. So we like to label that as a capital D. And then the shift, the decrease in demand, is going to be a capital D and then a 1 underneath it. That will represent the new demand line. So capital D is original demand, D1 would be the decrease in demand. Remember if we say well price goes up then that's going to simply mean a movement along the demand curve itself. If we say one of these eight things takes place then that's going to be either a decrease, a move to the left in demand, or an increase which is a move to the right of the line. Alright so let's get started with the eight determinants. The first of the eight determinants is numbers of consumers. Now you're going to see that with demand, almost all the rest of them, the next seven, you could argue are all a difference in the number of consumers in demand. You'd be correct with that, um, but they're going to be a little bit more specific. So let's talk about the number of consumers. I'm sure sitting there, I'm going to ask you this question, and you can probably tell me back, um, although I can't hear you obviously, that if the number of consumers increases, if there's more people in demand of something, which way do you think the demand line is going to move? to the right. If there are less consumers, people will stop buying your, the product, then there's going to be a shift to the left. It won't affect price, notice, but it will affect the number of people that are, going to, that are in demand for it. All right, so let me tell you a little bit of a story. If you've ever been in the National Western Stock Show, um, you're going to know what I'm talking about. If you've never been, you need to go. Um, it happens in Denver. Uh, it's usually kind of chilly. I, I'm trying to think. It's probably in the spring semester that it happens. I might be mistaken. Uh, but we go every single year, my family and I. Um, Thor is going to mutt and bust uh, when he's old enough to do so. And again, if you've been, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you need to go and just watch mutt and busting. But the hotels around um, the Western T Stock Show, which actually takes place in the Denver Coliseum, your average typical time that you drive by them you're going to see a rate of about $36 or so, give or take. Um, this was taken, this picture is taken of a Motel 6 right around the, uh, the Denver Coliseum. But during the National Western Stock Show, there's going to be an increase in consumers. And so these variables can 
change price, but price will not change demand. And we're going to talk about something called elasticity. When we talk about elasticity to supply, this is going to make a lot more sense. All you need to know for right now is if there are going to be more consumers, what do you think is going to happen to the price of this motel? You're correct, it's going to go up. And that was the actual picture taken last year. It was actually 73 bucks of room uh, at the Motel 6 right around the Denver Coliseum during the time of the Nasser National Western Stock Show. So again, you might say, wait a second, you just told us that price doesn't change demand. It doesn't. This didn't change demand, right? Demand did change price because the number of consumers increased. And also, I mixed supply in there with it. So again, stay tuned for a better explanation of this example. All right. So again, what does an increase in demand look like that? And then if I, if I were to throw supply in there, supply would look what we call inelastic because there are a set number of hotel rooms. So my supply line would look something like that, only a straight line. And you can see that there was beforehand the price of the hotel room beforehand, and here's the price of the hotel room after. So because it's where supply and demand cross, you can see that an increase in price happened because demand shifted. All right, the next one is income normal good. So it has to do with the consumer income. Now, normal good, I'm going to click through the, the, the PowerPoint and give you both the definition of a normal and inferior good. A normal good is that as your income goes up, demand for normal goods increase. You may see this referred to as a luxury good as well. Income inferior goods are going to have the opposite effect. As your income goes down, your demand for those inferior products goes up. And as your income goes up, demand for those inferior products go down. So let me give you two examples of a normal and an inferior good. One example of a normal good would be these refried beans. Any kind of like store brought or gen store, sorry, uh, given or generic brand would be considered an inferior good. There are other products that are real similar to those, um, but they're not store brand. M my favorite food is cereal. Nobody asked me about cereal, or you, you were supposed to ask me about cereal. Uh, we'll see that that is going to be tomorrow uh, for the first class. Um, but again, I could eat cereal nonstop like every single day. We know that there are the name brand cereals and the store brought, uh, the store brand cereals, which that doesn't make any difference. I'd eat both the same. So this is would be considered an inferior good. As your income increases, you tend to buy less and less uh, store brands. Uh, this, is, this would be an example of it depends, right? This is an actual name brand, um, and there are store brand instant noodles. Um, however, usually ramen in and of itself is an inferior good as far as a food goes. So that you'd have to have a little bit more information. We'll talk about that a little bit more. If you want to know what question you should ask so that I make sure that you watch these, um, ask me about my friend who lived off of ramen noodles and um, the little packets, um, and I'll tell you that story. Another example of an inferior good right there, usually used furniture is an inferior good. Uh, that sweet lazy boy would be definitely a normal good. Um, here's a used, a picture of a used car. Those tend to be inferior goods because as people's income goes up, demand then shifts to the right for new cars and shifts to the left, so they're in less demand of it, for used cars. And again, there would be a brand new, way awesome Audi. All right, so the fourth one is preferences. This is the one most people uh, pick as far as their demand. As your preferences change, so does the demand. So preferences for, let's say, a VCR, all right, people don't prefer VCRs that much anymore. And so the demand has decreased greatly. Um, where nowadays they prefer Blu-ray players and DVD players. The next step, so you're going to see that the next thing that people are going to be in high demand of are the digital copies. So as your preferences change, so do your demands. As preferences for, let's say, an iPod increase, demand for those iPods will increase. As preferences for a Walkman, if you even know what that is, decrease, so does demand. Number five is price of related goods substitutes. And so we're going to talk about two substituted goods, Coke and Pepsi. Now this is going to have a price component to it. Um, however, again, you're going to have to listen carefully. So my, uh, my good is, is Coke. And so let's say that uh, King Supers decides to sell Cokes, oh, let's say for uh, $3.99. Or we'll make it 4 so I can write 4 on here. All right, and Pepsi is that exact same 
it, it holds that exact same price. But let's say then uh, Pepsi decides they're going to put their uh, Pepsi on sale. So they're in the same. And so they're going to drop the price of Pepsi um, from $4 to $3. So the price of Pepsi has changed. All right. Remember, your original product was the Coke. All right, so Coke is now $1 more expensive. What do you think demand for that is going to do? If you said decrease, you're right. So it's still the same price, but demand is now decreased for Coke because it's the more expensive of the two products. And so what substitutes mean is the fact that, as you can see, the quantity right there, the new quantity is going to be right here. So again, as the price changed for one item, the substitute, holding all else constant, we're assuming that people prefer these equally, the substitute then is decreased. Uh, let me move on to price-related good complements. These are goods that tend to, uh, when you buy one, you buy the other one. Um, I'll use the classic example of peanut butter and jelly. And so let's say the price of peanut butter is four seems to be easy for me to write. And so the price is four dollars. All right, there's the, the demand line for it. All right, so you're going to buy, you tend to buy then jelly as well. All right, let's say the price, let's say there's a big peanut shortage and the price goes up to then uh, six dollars. All right, so the demand drops for the quantity demand, it drops then. Uh, for peanut butter, what do you think the demand for jelly is going to do? It's going to decrease. And so price change over here meant a change in demand over here. The last two are expected future price by consumers. And think about this. If you're expecting the price of gas to go up uh, 50 cents like it did in California just recently, 50 cents, then you're going to fill up and you think that it's going to go up another 50 cents tomorrow, you're going to fill up now. You're going to fill up at that low price. So if you expect the future price to increase, then demand right now increases. If you think the price is going to fall on something, you're going to wait to buy it, which means the demand is going to decrease. So if the expected future price is going to increase, then demand increases now. If the expected future price is going to uh, decline, then you tend to, to wait and then... Um, and then buy the product when it when it uh, when the price falls, and then the last one is expected future income by consumers. If you think you're going to get a raise, demand for products tend to increase. So if you think your future income is going to increase, you tend to then to be more in demand of what type of goods? Typically, normal goods. And we see this when people start getting out of college. They tend to do what with it? Buy new cars, uh, buy a house, and that's because they're expecting their income to go up and so demand for that stuff goes up. If you think you're going to get fired, you tend or you think you're going to get laid off of your job, or you're not going to have a job anymore, you, demand in general tends to decline. Um, and so that would mean a shift to the left. All right, so that was the eight determinants of demand. We're going to talk about this more in class uh, tomorrow or the next day. I will see you guys then.